it's Alex. I'm here with a new sorcery deck that I've built. Uh, this is, I call it the Ocean. It's a mono water deck. And I, I built it because uh, water also often gets panned for not being a very competitive deck. And I just wanted to see how to make a water deck that worked. So um, the first thing is I've chosen the Seer. And the reason I've chosen the Seer is that the water deck wants to play sites most turns. So spending my avatar's turn tapping to draw or play sites is what I want to do most of the time. But there are very specific cards that are super powerful when you're playing all water sites, and I want to be able to find those cards. Uh, so the, the top card in that is Mariner's Curse. Uh, every time a minion enters an affected water site, submerge it and return Mariner's Curse to its owner's hand. This is a reusable removal effect. Uh, it can be defensive, like you play it and then your opponent just doesn't want to enter your sites. But it can also be an offensive tool when combined with cards like Riptide and Undertow or Maelstrom. Uh, in a long game, these can really just take over, and this is, in my opinion, the best reason to play all water sites. Um, just incredibly good card, and along with Angel's Egg, this is the card that I'm digging for the most with this seer. Um, Flood is a card that is kind of a, a concession to the fact that a lot of the good water minions uh, have water bound or other effects that strongly reward being on water sites. Uh, it also allows us to enchant our opponent's sites and then play Mariner's Curse on their sites, um, possibly just shutting down their ability to summon minions without having to pay attacks of the first minion they summon each turn. Um, so, uh, really great synergies there. Uh, Atlantean Fate. Uh, this card is obviously just one of the best cards in sorcery. Taking away your opponent's threshold could completely mess up their game. Um, much like Earthquake, it can kill multiple minions on the opposing side. And, you know, they kind of have to spend their entire game playing around it or risk getting uh, blown out by it. It also creates water sites, which is advantageous for the same reasons as Flood. Um, Nicotic Manuscript is one of the best draw engines in Sorcery. It usually wants two things, either creatures that are expendable, um, which most of them aren't, you know, you're not usually playing creatures because you don't want them, uh, or uh, creatures that are resistant to damage, and this deck kind of has both. Uh, water decks make a bunch of frogs, or they can, uh, which are very expendable. And then this deck is also playing Anui Undi, which has uh, power scaling with the number of water sites in this body of water. Um, and sometimes there are situations where you don't have a flood or your opponent's destroyed your flood, and you can stick your manuscript on the Undi and dig for more floods. Uh, so the Undi kind of has a purpose. And since nothing in the deck costs more than five, if you have a large enough body of water, the Undine will also never die. Um, so I think this is a really good card in games that get more attrition based. Uh, Angel's Egg is probably the most important card in Sorcery if you're not an aggressive deck. You know, inevitably you're going to get some chip damage and a lot of players are playing all kinds of burn spells or crater eyes to finish you off. So Angel's Egg can make it so that you kind of get out of burn range for any deck that was uh, just kind of like aggressively sacrificing to get to your life total. Uh, at this point, I'm putting it in almost all of my decks. Uh, Sunken Treasure is kind of a, a flex slot. Uh, I've tried all kinds of cards here, like Mix Aqua and um, Hydras, Pirate Ships. Uh, at this point, though, it's just kind of um, in an average game, it gets you more of the good stuff you're going for. And since uh, Seer doesn't have a lot of card advantage, 
Um, this is my go-to right now, but, you know, who knows? Depending on the metagame, it could be better as anything. Like, you know, in a really aggressive metagame, maybe Flow of Life is the right choice. Um, this deck is really above average at uh, getting Sunken Treasures off the ground. Like you can cast a Giant Shark on your Sunken Treasure, have it pick it up, and then when the Giant Shark is triggered, um, you know, it'll move to the surface and you get your treasure. Uh, frogs are good at moving it. Porcupine Pufferfish are good at moving it. You know, anyway, Undines are, like, quite powerful, and I mostly don't want to have them messing with treasure, but, you know, you can if it's necessary. Um, all right, so now we're going to get to the minions, and this is really um, why this deck works. Uh, I think that a lot of people build their water decks with a curve that's way too high, and we have to respect the very aggressive, like, Fire Earth Sorcerers, or even Air Earth uh, Avatars of Earth. Like, they really come out swinging with very powerful minions pretty early, and this deck has to have cheap interaction to deal with those things. So Porcupine Pufferfish is about as good as it gets. It only costs one. Um, you can cast it submerged in your sites so they can't get rid of it with removal. And you can cast it on kind of the first site that borders on your opponent's sites where early aggression is likely to land. And either they have to trade with it or slow down their aggression, either of which is a win for you. Um, you know, caution, if you cast them unsubmerged, uh, if your opponent's playing fire, they'll often kill it with a, like a violet, violet imp or a firebolt. So casting it submerged is strongly recommended there. Uh, but by contrast, if they're playing air, you know, um, and earth, casting it above ground can give it, you know, more range of motion. So, you know, don't make any automatic plays. Think about what your opponent is playing and make decisions accordingly. Um, Sedge Crabs. Uh, <laughs> this is probably the least expected card in the deck. Uh, you know, I really like Boss Troll and Earth, and Sedge Trab Crabs only cost one. Uh, they have the disadvantage that they can only move sideways, but this doesn't really stop them from defending your early sites. Um, th this can be a very efficient trade. Um, also, so many people are playing Rift Valley. You know, later in the game, the Sedge Crabs can also often turn aggressive without having to spend any additional resources. You know, you just cast them next to the Rift Valley and then have them scuttle over and attack. This is the card where, if it's not in the deck, you have a much better chance of being run over by aggressive decks. Um, you know, it's kind of like eating your vegetables or taking your medicine. Um, you know, it's the card that I end up scrying away the most later in the game, but I think it's kind of a, a necessary evil um, to keep the deck playable. Uh, Pirate Ship is awesome. Um, you know, part of why Earth is such a strong element is because it has several five power creatures that can be played for three or four mana. So this is Water's Answer. It has a five power creature that can be played for four mana. It has the Waterbound Restriction, which defensively is not nearly as problematic as any of the other ones. And offensively, you know, later in the game you're going to cast Flood. Uh, this is also not a bad card to stick a Necotic Manuscript on and tap, you know, as you can see from the curve. There are very few cards that cost five, so, you know, you might lose your pirate ship, but if the game is kind of stalled, throwing it on the pirate ship and digging is quite good. All right, Enemy Undine, this is probably the most important way to end the game, and uh, I usually try and play with these pretty thoughtfully. Um, if I'm playing against a fire-based deck, I'll cast them submerged and build my body of water until it's like, you know, let's say eight strength so that uh, I don't lose it. Uh, often trying to build my body of water up to 10 strength so that the undine can put my opponent at death's door in two attacks. Um, there are, you know, there's essentially aside from like Roots of Yggdrasil, there's no real way in this game to kill a submerged Anli Undine. So uh, if you're not under pressure, you can just manage very carefully how you play this card and like when you expose it. 
uh, giant shark. You know, this is this is the other kind of you play this in your body of water. It defends your body of water. The problem is your opponent can very easily control where the shark moves and when. So it's very easy for them to kill it if they have big creatures or fire spells. That said, if they don't have those tools at the right time, this card can really stall um, their development against you. And the giant shark has all kinds of weird interactions, like if you're playing against uh, Death Speaker with Genesis cards, if uh, the giant shark is triggered by the Genesis creature and it kills the Genesis creature, they don't get their Genesis trigger because it falls off the storyline. So a giant shark can be a powerful way to stop someone from putting a gin on you to kill you or you know, summoning violins to deal chip damage. So depending on the matchup, either you just want to play this early as a powerful defender to buy time to get you to your undines or your angel's eggs, set up your long-term strategy. But in other matchups, these are a, a strategic piece and you want to cast them on key turns before your opponent is able to execute their strategy. Uh, Plague of Frogs is just awesome. You get to summon seven frogs, uh, this could either represent chump blocking seven attacks and buying you a huge amount of life. It could represent, um, you know, seven cards with a Nicotic Manuscript. With uh, Mariner's Curse, having loose frogs can let you reset your curses by just swimming your frogs around. Um, so, yeah, lots of uses there. Riptide, fantastic card. You can use it to get your avatar out of the way of, you know, Pudge Butcher's Line of Fire. You can pull creatures into Mariner's Curses. You could pull avatars at Death's Door out of their, you know, defensive situation. Just really flexible. Um, unless you really need the card, try and save the card for tactical situations where it's useful. Uh, drown. You know, three mana, kill anything in water. Uh, very good for things that have gotten into your space. Uh, you know, sometimes you cast a Mariner's Curse and they sacrifice a small creature and then come in and hit you with a big creature. And Drown is, you know, the most reliable way to, like, get rid of that creature afterwards. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of ways to, like, kill a pirate ship or a pufferfish, but... Uh, you know, sometimes defensive creatures don't always do the trick, so killing something that's big uh, can be key. And then also, you know, if someone has a utility creature like a Queen of Midlands, if you can flood the area that she's in and then drown them, that's often your, your best line. Uh, you know, I, I experimented with Stormy Seas, but costing four uh, is just really tough because you have a lot of other things you want to do at four mana. And saving the mana so far has been better for me, but I have talked to other water players who are like actually being able to hit two or three for one people who don't play around it is better than the mana savings. So that's something that I'm you know still thinking about. So that's that's my forty card atlas. And then as far as sites go, um, you know rivers are great. They help you dig for Mariner's Curse or Angel's Egg or whatever you're looking for in your spell deck. Um, Floodplain is less useful in this deck than other water decks, but still the ability to turn a site to water can unexpectedly kill, you know, a uh, root spider, or let you riptide into an unexpected space, um, or have a undine, you know, crack for an extra point of damage. Uh, so pretty cool. Um, Island Leviathans were a card when, that when I was playing with Sorcerer weren't good at all, but when I changed to Seer, you know, I found that my games went long, I regularly got up to this amount of threshold, and that my deck was a little light on threats, and getting a, you know, kind of free threat was quite useful. Um, one thing to try and keep in mind, especially against air decks, is avoiding getting your Island Leviathans and or your 
undines all vulnerable to the twister at the same time. You really want to, um, you, you have a few really big threats and you, you want to avoid getting, you know, blown out by losing two of them because then your games can go for a very long time. You can still win through it, it's just annoying. Maelstrom, probably the best site in the deck. Being able to force trigger things like Shark or Mariner's Curse kind of at will and also to maneuver your own creatures without them spending their movement um, are just all super powerful. And, you know, once you've flooded your opponent's side of the board, uh, this also just causes all kinds of problems for them in terms of positioning. Um, Mirror Realm, you know, you get to duplicate the best of whatever other sites you have, even though it's not, you know, technically a water site. You have all water sites, so it's a water site. Um, more rivers. Uh, tadpole pool. Frogs are just really helpful. This site is half a plague of frogs. You know, really happy every time I have it. And then uh, Undertow is probably the site that I try and use the most strategically. Um, it can pull units, so you can move your avatar, enemy avatar. If I have this site and I can afford it, I will often try to sandbag it in my hand so I can use it at a key strategic moment rather than just throwing it down. Uh, you know, that said, if I'm playing against a, any fire spellcaster, I will happily use it to move my seer off the central line so they, they can't just like jam firebolts or fireballs at me. So uh, that's the deck. Some notes on playing it are that uh, forming a square uh, initially is really good because you can use Mariner's Curse to protect all of it. Um, and, you know, as usual, I think playing against fire decks, you don't want them to have sites that are next to your back row because you want places for your avatar to be safe from them dropping like a Quarrelsome Kobolds or a Violin. Uh, and then, like, directly pinging your spellcaster. Uh, other than that, um, you know, no really big notes, but mostly, you know, think carefully about building squares so that your enchantments can protect things, and also corralling your opponent to build in squares so that you can efficiently flood clusters of their sites. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you know, Feel free to jam things in the comments, and I will try and get to them as I can. Uh, if you like this video, like it, subscribe it, and I'll try and keep making deck videos and maybe even gameplay videos uh, as I have time. All right, thanks, and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you about another deck next time.